Now, in the first video of this course, you learned that the cell is the smallest living unit. In this video, I'll try to expand your horizons a little bit more and explain what the cell theory is. We haven't always known what a cell is. It wasn't until the invention of microscopes that we started to understand what makes up all living organisms. The first microscope is sometimes said to have been invented by Antony van Leeuwenhoek in the 1600s. He discovered a way to make almost perfectly round small glass pearls, which he mounted inside a metal plate. The specimen was placed on this tip, and the whole apparatus, about the size of a matchbox, was held in front of the eye. Through the lens, van Leeuwenhoek saw what no one had seen before him. He examined sperm from different species and formulated a theory of how sperm fertilizes eggs. He examined blood and discovered red blood cells, among other things. Another type of microscope was built by Robert Hooke, a contemporary of van Leeuwenhoek. Here I would like to show you a picture of Hooke, but unfortunately no portraits of him remain to this day. Some say it's because he was very ugly, others that Isaac Newton, his arch enemy, destroyed all the portraits when Hook died. Anyway, this is Hook's drawing of his microscope. The light source is an oil lamp here, and the light was focused on the specimen by this water-filled glass sphere. The light reflected on the specimen and was enlarged through a series of lenses in this tube, and you looked at it through this eyepiece. This is almost the same way that modern light microscopes work. There's a light source down here, and you place the specimen here on the stage. The focus knobs are used to raise and lower the stage to get focus. The light passes through a diaphragm and condenser, which determine how much light is let through. The objective lenses are mounted on a revolver, letting you choose the magnification. The eyepiece or ocular lenses further magnify the image. Hook also drew what he saw, and fortunately he was a skilled artist. Just look at this drawing of the underside of a louse. And take a look at this amazing drawing of a flea. Hook published his findings in a book called Micrographia, which was a huge success. Never before had the small life been described in such exquisite detail. Another one of all the samples that Hook studied was the bark of some cork oak. In this sample, he saw something that he thought resembled the cells of a monastery. In this way, he coined the term cell, although nobody yet knew what a cell actually was, or is. So what is a cell? What characterizes it? Well, let's write like this, that all cells have a cell membrane and a cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is a fluid-like intracellular substance that is a substance inside the cell. All cells also contain DNA in one or several chromosomes. Now, let's have a look at some real cells. These are bacteria, photographed in a scanning electron microscope. These animal cells are actually my cells from the inside of my cheek, stained and photographed through a light microscope. The darker spots you see here are the nuclei, making the cells look rather like fried eggs, sunny side up. And since these are my own cells, does that make this image a selfie? Anyway, here are also some plant cells. You can see their shape is much more regular than the typical animal cell. The darker spots you see are also nuclei. So what about this cell theory? What does it say? Well, the cell theory describes what an organism is and how it relates to cells. It says that all organisms consist of one or more cells. The cell is considered the fundamental living unit, and cells make up all living organisms. Also, new cells can only arise from other cells. This means that essentially you need cells to build an organism. But what do you need to build a cell? You need four different types of macromolecules, and I'll explain what each of them is. They are polysaccharides, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. First of all, polysaccharides are made of sugar. Now, I'm going to assume that you haven't studied any chemistry at all yet. Because of this, I only draw a sugar molecule like a hexagon like this. This, by the way, is actually quite often the way sugar molecules are drawn. 
The word polysaccharide literally means many sugars. A polysaccharide is thus made from several sugar molecules somewhat like this. Three important types of polysaccharides are cellulose, which make up the plant cell walls, starch, which serves as energy storage in plants, and glycogen, which serves as energy storage in many animals, including humans. Proteins are made of amino acids. Proteins are also very large molecules, macromolecules, as you can see in this image, where every sphere represents an atom in the protein. In the protein, the amino acids are linked together in a long, long chain, somewhat like beads on a string. And yes, I really do think you should copy this image to your notes too. The amino acids may be, for example, phenylalanine, alanine, serine, and histidine. Alanine has this structural formula. Different amino acids have different R groups, which in all living cells is one of 20 different kinds. Among the lipids are fats, which are made of glycerol plus fatty acids. As I said before, I assume you haven't studied chemistry yet, so right now I'm only going to show this like using Lego blocks, sort of. This is supposed to be a glycerol molecule, and the three fatty acids it reacts with are quite long, like this. Together, they form a fat molecule. Phospholipids are similar to fat molecules in that they consist of a glycerol molecule to which fatty acids bind. But in this case, there are only two fatty acids. In the third position, there is instead a phosphate-containing group. The glycerol residue with the phosphate-containing group form what is called a hydrophilic head. That is, a part that, so to speak, loves water. This means that the head is soluble in water. The fatty acids instead form hydrophobic tails, that is, they fear water. This means that they are not soluble in water, but instead in, for example, other lipids. Most often, we simplify the phospholipid even further and draw it just like this. We also write here that cell membranes are made of phospholipids. In a cell membrane like this, the phospholipids form a double layer. In this way, the hydrophilic heads are exposed to the surrounding water. The hydrophobic tails are instead on the inside of the membrane. Let's write this too, that the cell membrane consists of a double layer of phospholipids. Finally, the nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, are made of a kind of molecules that are called nucleotides. In this image, there's a single DNA strand down here and an RNA strand up here. This is a nucleotide, and when new RNA is synthesized, it binds to the growing RNA molecule like this. I'll explain this properly in future videos. What I would like to point out here is something about the structure of the nucleic acids. They both have a so-called backbone with alternating sugar and phosphate residues here. In between the backbones there are nucleobases. For now we'll just say that there are five different nucleobases and that A always pairs with T or U and vice versa and G always pairs with C, and vice versa. Now that you've learned some more about the cell theory and what characterizes a cell, don't forget that you can read more and check your learning on my homepage. Links are in the description.